Welcome to Channel 18 News, I'm Jim Rogers. Special Ranger Tony Hurley said the recovery of 57 head of stolen livestock is just the tip of the iceberg in theft of livestock in the area and will probably lead to others being charged with engaging in organized crime. Francisco Ledesma was charged with the theft of the 57 head recently. Hurley covers an 11 county area in Northeast Texas for the Southwestern Cattlemen's Association. He stated that an individual working a large dairy uh, with a large number of cattle say 3,000 head and surrounded by other large dairies could steal a few head at a time, place them on leased land nearby and sell them off a few at a time. I was out of town when uh, this case broke loose. I, I assisted the sheriff's office early on in the first uh, call that we had received about some uh, old 250 pound Holstein heifers go missing down around the uh, Como Picton area. and. Uh, uh, they had a break on that. I think, uh, I think it was the fifth or sixth of uh, of April was was la early last week. Uh, we have an annual annual convention that TSCRA has every year, and uh, I was a, a part of that. And so I was out of town when I received that call. I'd called uh, Lewis Tatum to uh, to follow up on that that information that I had. Uh, that snowballed into the next three or four days recovering um, between 55 and 60 head of cattle. And we suspect that we're gonna probably find some more. We've, we've got a lot of record digging to do and uh, a lot of research to do uh, in this case. Uh, obviously, it's a, a large amount of cattle that's been taken over a long period of time. And so this is probably gonna take a while to uh, uh, formulate what's been, what's been stolen and, and try to find where they possibly have went. This involves a lot of paperwork, and doesn't it? Going through uh, sale barn a records. A lot of records, yes, sir. Um, um, how much how much field time versus office time does this mean for you? Well, it, it, it'll be a lot. It'll be a lot out in the field, and then obviously putting it down on paper will take a, time, a lot of time also. You've been involved in, in a number of investigations just here in Hopkins County, but this isn't the limit of, the, of, of your investigative area, is it? No, sir. I, I cover 11 counties in the northeast Texas area, uh, from Lamar County all the way down to uh, Rains and then back over towards Texas County. In fact, I, I was in, uh, in trial yesterday up in Red River County on a 2014 case that we dissolved yesterday. The, uh, the investigation into uh, this kind of theft, uh, it's more than just cattle, isn't it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, you know, a lot of times uh, you have several different type of cattle thieves or equipment thieves or just thieves in general, and uh, you have more like uh, like what we've been working on all these Polaris and ATV thefts. Uh, that's more of an organized crime ring, and I think this is where this is probably headed. It's more of an organized, uh, and as we find more people involved, uh, more than likely this theft of livestock will be uh, bumped to engaging in organized criminal activity. Um, I, I suspect it will. To to steal cattle in Texas was was quite the offense in days gone by. Is it still as strong an offense today? Well, the thing about theft of livestock versus theft of a television or uh, something like that, uh, you have a, lat a ladder that you go by on a scale uh, as far as the monetary value of a of an item. Um, and you, you get almost up to $25,000 before it's a third degree felony. It's a state jail felony, which is punishable by two years maximum. Theft of livestock is a little different in that one baby calf that just hit the ground is a third degree felony. And uh, TSCRA lobbied for several years to try to get that law changed in Austin and, and was successful in doing that with the help of, of all the farmers and ranchers uh, throughout the state. Because that is a lot of times, that is someone's livelihood. And we still have some unsolved cases here in Hopkins County. Uh, of course, I, you know, I was with the Sheriff's Office to about 21 years before I went to work for Texas and Southwest Cattle Raisers. And, and we have some cases that uh, from four years ago that we haven't found those cattle. And uh, we're, we're still working those cases and we're still trying to find them. We're not going to give up on that. 
part of the 20 year legacy of Hopkins County Sheriff Butch Adams will be the building of a new jail. Adams credits county commissioners with much of the leadership. However, his team of investigators, deputies, jailers, and staff, which he calls his second family, not only necessitated the jail thanks to their diligent work, but also assisted in making the current jail less stress for the sheriff. Along with jail improvements, a new jail administrator who was, is a retired warden and has 30 years experience in the Texas Department of Criminal Justice has continued the quality of work performed toward those who are incarcerated in Hopkins County Jail. Glad for our new building in the new jail area and it is a wonderful experience for us. It will hold up to 194? 192. 192. And um, how soon do you perceive it being full? Well, hopefully not for a long time, but we know that the way everything's going, it'll probably be next few years. I know there was some talk about uh, the possibility of um, contracting with others. H have you pursued that at all? Or? Um, we've talked to some people about it, um, but nothing firm. Um, and one option, I mean, that we've talked about was the federal through Sherman and uh, but to do that you have to look at adding more employees and usually when you sign a contract you're responsible for transportation when they're needing them in Sherman or wherever and so you nearly have to have a dedicated person doing that and so that's something we'll have to look at when we ever decide what changes have been made in, in personnel as it relates to the jail? Uh, luckily, the commissioners, knowing that we were going to need them, uh, added six jailers when we started before we moved. So we could, uh, they had the money in place. And so when we came here, we automatically had six more employees to compensate for the, what at the time was about 140 we were having. As it relates to administration <clears throat> in the jail, have you, have you uh, brought in any new people to help with uh, uh, overseeing the work that's there in the jail? Um, not really that. We've got the jail administrator, we've got the chief jailer, and then we have um, a couple other uh, people who do like records and do that. Uh, so. Uh, we pretty much have what we had at the other place. It's just we added more on the on the ground type people. Okay, um, I understand. Uh, Lewis was telling me about a man that's been hired to be the administrator. Uh, yes, his name's Kenneth Dean. He is a retired warden from TDCJ, and uh, he's he knows the aspects of the warden t uh, being a warden and running a criminal. TDC unit and so his experience along with uh, what he'll learn as through jail standards will be I think an excellent deal for us. Uh, it's good to have that kind of experience will come in. Oh definitely. Uh, our other one decided he wanted to go be a police so he he transferred to patrol and so we had already had him hired and we're real impressed with him. The um, aspects of running the jail. What's it costing basically to run the jail now? Oh. Is the cost is the cost more or less with this new facility? Uh, well, with the added people, it, you could say it costs more. But uh, hopefully, with the technology and like, give an example when you like over on our side and in parts of there, when you walk into an area, the lights come on. And a little while after you leave the area, the lights go off. So that's, and everything we've got back there is energy saving, the air conditioners, water heaters, um, pretty much everything back there. So hopefully, of course, we've got a bigger building, so it's gonna be a little more, but hopefully the savings will be because we've got uh, the technology in place. Every building has its vulnerabilities. Uh, has anyone tested the waters to see if they can uh, find a way out? 
Uh, not that we know of. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, our um, what used to be our outside rec area for the inmates uh, is now inside, so they're pretty much in a room big enough that they can do whatever. And uh, But they're under lock and key. They can't climb out because it's solid room. All right. So, so uh, kind of overcome some of those issues. Mm, yes, definitely. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> uh, with uh, uh, all that's going on, food service, have you changed anything in that particular one? No, we're still with the same company where uh, we basically give them account and they send enough for that. It's like everything else. Food rises, they rise on the what you pay them but uh, we we're still open and still look at if something else comes up that we will try to do that now, I know you have a few more months in office here but uh, do you see this jail as one of the major achievements of your administration oh definitely definitely and it wasn't just my ideal it was the commissioners they got behind it in the county judge both of them at the time and uh, it's been a blessing for us because we now have a space that we can work in that people are on top of each other right you know you, you assembled a, a very good team uh, of, of people to work with I, I feel I've got an excellent team um, I, I basically call them my second family and I'm big on if we have a get together like Christmas, Thanksgiving, we have a meal for the employees and anybody else that wants to come and their families. And I'm big on family, and that's I think has helped a tremendous amount on that. Uh, everybody working together. Yes. <laughs> and you've, you've had some. Uh, uh, do you feel too that this creates the uh, attitude of wanting to? make discoveries and investigations and so forth i certainly do yes think it'll continue i think it will it, it when you got your one of the main ones who's the go-getter <laughs> that's now going to be in the office a lot uh, you might see a little change but i think under his leadership that we will still do real good on our clearance rates and recovery rates and because he knows everybody. <laughs> Silver Springs Independent School District School Board held their monthly meeting Monday night in the Administrative Building Boardroom. During the public forum, forum portion of the meeting, board members were presented with an update on the Civic Center Auditorium renovation project by Charlie Wilson, supervisor for the project. Wilson told the board that they expected the renovations to be completed by mid-May in hopes of a children's concert scheduled for May 15th being one of the first events in the newly renovated auditorium. Board members were then presented with numerous administrative reports and also Kimberly Williams presented a report of the 2015-2016 School Health Advisory Committee activities. She said that the committee's involvement in the annual Kids Safe Saturday proved to be beneficial. The board approved six action items during the meeting, which included an instructional materials allotment, a Head Start priority screening instrument, 2016-2017 School Health Advisory Council members, an update to the local board policy for FFA, and an engagement letter with Rutherford Taylor and Company PC to conduct audit services for the fiscal year ending in August of this year. During the executive session, the board members discussed and considered approving professional employment contracts contracts, the hiring of an assistant superintendent for secondary education and state federal programs, they hired Josh Williams, and hiring a food services director, along with a principal for Travis Primary School. Resignations and staff changes can be found on kssdradio.com, as can other stories related to the school board. Related to Head Start, during the public uh, item presentation to the Sulphur Springs Independent School District Board during the monthly meeting Monday night, Director of Head Start Hillary Young presented two grant application requests for the board to consider for approval. The first request was for a partnership grant that would expand the early childhood start uh, the Early Head Start program and allowed the, uh, for the Early Head Start program to provide childcare 
if approved by the school board, that would apply for a grant and uh, if accepted, the school district would be then partner with a child care facility in Silver Springs to provide early education for any younger age group in the community. Grant funding would be provided in five year cycles. The school board seems to be enthusiastic for the program, but will delay a decision on the program. Monday's five o'clock hour was somewhat intense in Hopkins County as a severe thunderstorm passed through Cumbie at 440, Sulphur Springs at 510, and Como at 545 p.m. The National Weather Service issued a severe thunderstorm warning that turned into a tornado warning for Hopkins County, Northern Rains County, and Southeastern Hunt Counties. As the storm passed through, multiple reports of hail of various sizes, from pea size to half dollar size to softball size, were reported to us here at KSST as we followed the storm across the county. A second storm ban of rain uh, passed through the area as well. Uh, that uh, uh, storm ban as it passed through, the majority of that storm went south of our area, creating damage uh, to Wood County and other counties to our south. For more than a dozen years, Rick Wilson has offered a cooking class, specifically Dutch oven cooking, in memory of John Buffalo Chester and his famous outdoor cooking camps. All the flavor and the hospitality and fun can be yours on Saturday, April 16th in beautiful Heritage Park. Now you can come to learn to cook and come to enjoy the tasting of the delicious results of the class. A good Saturday coming up for cooking. It's going to be a Saturday, that's for sure. We, we're not <laughs> sure how good it's going to be. We're going to be there rain or shine, knowing we've got a covered pavilion we can work under, and and so we're excited. We've got about 25 folks signed up right now. We'll still take folks if they want to come out. We'll, we'll, we can accommodate some more, okay. and uh, it's uh, $15, okay. and uh, if you want to come out and cook, just show up or call me, and uh, we can get that all squared away and have folks out there to cook and have a good time. Well, you know, when you're an outdoor <coughs> cook, then you, you just bend towards whatever the weather oh, yeah. dishes no out. No doubt about that. <laughs> no doubt about that. Now, the ins and outs of Dutch oven cooking include partly about the equipment that you use. Oh, sure. And we, maybe not everybody has the extensive line of ovens that you have in Skillet. Probably not. <laughs> uh, uh, between myself and Carly, we're, we're well equipped to, to do just about anything. And, and cooking in any size oven that we need. And we'll have probably with 20 ovens cooking at one time or another, 25, do it all having different things in them. And that's the fun part about it. These classes, you can get so many people involved because there is so much that you want to prepare. Uh, we'll do three or four different breads and desserts and different meals meats and vegetables. We just do an array of different things. And we try to get everybody involved in it. We keep the fires going. And, and uh, it it's, makes it very interesting to have that much going for us because, you, you, yes, you may have two or three different people working on one pot, but we got to keep up with all of them. It, it, it makes it a lot of fun. And uh, the people usually come out and have a lot of fun, and they get to eat pretty well, too. So that's what we like. Well, once you learn these skills of how to manage this uh, cast iron equipment and the fires and cutting up and put what it is that you can cook and maybe that you don't want to cook as a beginner, yeah. then then you're on your own. You're on the road. Yes, most definitely. But uh, all, all the practice that you can do after that and the experimentation, improvisation later once you get back home. Oh, yeah. You it's can, endless. It's endless. Absolutely. We, we've got people that'll cook every weekend or twice a month in, in them and they'll call and say, okay, we did this uh, uh, is it supposed to do this or did, did we get it cooked enough well, I, you can't tell by it but you know all you can ask them is what was your temperature and where did you go and and uh, but it, it's funny some of the phone calls you'll get they'll want to know why something came out this way or another way it, it got a little burn on the bottom what was I doing wrong well, you had too much heat <laughs> but you know you, you try to, to 
do as much as you can to let these folks know it doesn't matter. Just keep on cooking. And you know what? A lot of it is just hands-on. Oh, yes. 95% of it is hands-on. Uh, if you can cook it inside, you can cook it outside in a Dutch oven. It's about that simple. It is so amazing. Now, I have one tried-and-true recipe, and mostly all the time I don't vary from it very much. I'm not, um, I am not. don't have a wide array of things I like to cook in a Dutch oven, but I sure like to enjoy those, that, like the breads that you do. Yes. And some of the more elaborate desserts. Yes. There is some that are really stand out uh, more than I would have ever dreamed. Uh, some of them are getting very elaborate in some <laughs> of their Dutch oven cooking. Uh, uh, we had a, a, a young lady in our youth division last year at our Dutch oven contest that she fixed a dessert just because she, she didn't have to. She just wanted to, and she brought it over and says, I know I wasn't supposed to be judged, but I want the judges to taste it. And they look at it and go, wow, who did this? Mm. I said, that 14-year-old little girl over there. So really? anybody can learn to do this. And she's had good teachers, oh, cool. and she loves it and has competed and said she'd be back next year. So she'll, we look forward to seeing her in the fall. That is just marvelous. Yeah. Well, when we do the class, or when you do the class, it is going to be uh, of a morning and at the Heritage Park. Yes, it'll be at Heritage Park this Saturday morning, the 16th. It's like I said, it's $15 a person for if anybody wants to come out. And they can call me at 903-335-2752 if they want to, or just... Come out. Just show up. Uh, okay. We'll make sure that there's a, enough food for everybody to have plenty to eat and have a good time. So a cook will maybe bring an assistant or two? Uh, they can. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Or we've had individuals show up. We had a group of ladies come in last year from Dallas, and they wanted to be a team. And so they came back in October and competed. So they had a blast. Well, the class in the spring, such as now, not to be confused with the contest in the fall. Right. Absolutely. Two different things. And Two different when things. you come to the class, you will learn some stuff and you we'll, practice on it and stay in practice. We'll do, like I said, several different recipes uh, and teach you how to use the charcoal. And, you know, a lot of people like to use open flame and use coals off the fire. That takes practice, a little bit more practice, okay. but you can get used to doing that without any problem. Uh, we got a lot of people that do it, and it's a lot of fun. Uh, plus, you can keep keep warm with an open fire. <laughs> There's just something about cooking with open coals yeah. that, that's totally different. So it's a lot of fun. And it'll, yes. be, it'll be great on Saturday. The mornings have been cool. Here's Don with sports. After day one of the regional golf tournament at the Rockwall Golf and Athletic Club on Monday, Wildcats golf coach Ross Funk said that his team had a lot of work to do on day two on Tuesday. The Wildcats were in the thick of things after play Monday. The top two teams at the regional tournament advanced to state along with the top two golfers on teams not going to state. The Wildcats are tied for sixth place after day one. Their 317 score ties them with Prosper and Nacogdoches for sixth place. Frisco shot 301 to lead. Mansfield Legacy and Lindale shot 307 each. Frisco Wakeland had 311 and Texas High shot 314. Among individuals, Wildcats Brody Blackman and Alex Motes both shot 73. They are tied for seven Seventh place, but they're only two shots out of first place. Other Wildcat scores on day one were Matt Calhoun, 82, Caleb Lewis, 89, and Carter Lewis, 92. Round two Tuesday was delayed a bit due to some storm damage on the course. The Lady Cats home softball game at Lady Cat Park against Mount Pleasant schedule for this evening has been postponed due to weather grounds. The game has been rescheduled for Wednesday at 4.30 p.m. with no JV game scheduled before the varsity contest. Meanwhile, the Wildcats baseball game at Mount Pleasant Tuesday night is still a goal, but the starting time has been changed from 7 p.m. until 7.30 p.m. 
the JV contest before the varsity game was canceled. Thanks for watching Channel 18 News. Have a great evening.